My name is Chuck Collins, and I'm a senior scholar here at the Institute for Policy Studies, where I also coordinate something called the Working Group on Extreme Inequality. Uh, we just co-published an issue, we helped edit an issue of The Nation on the new inequality, which we have out in the hallway there, and Barbara and uh, others have articles in there, so draw attention to that as part of our work. And in that issue, we talked about how extreme inequality, the growing disparities of wealth and power, were contributing and contribute to economic instability. Um, so that theme of our, our discussion today is the Wall Street meltdown, economic inequality, and the election. Now, I have to thank Karen Dolan, who helped to organize this session. Back at the end of August, in, or in early September, she seemed to have some prescient sense that today would be a good day to have this conversation. Uh, and also my other IPS colleagues, Adju, and others who helped set up and make this possible. Um, this is the first of six programs that are part of a series that the Institute's sponsoring called Mandate for Leadership. Uh, we have three sessions prior to the election, three sessions after the election. Uh, the next session is on the 6th, and it's looking at war and peace in the election. And my colleague Phyllis Bennis and several others will be speaking at that. And there's a whole schedule of those events uh, uh, at the door. They're part of the lead-up to a book that uh, is going to be published after the election called Mandate for Change, edited by Chester Hartman, who's here. And it's a, a, ser a series of uh, essays and policy recommendations for an incoming administration. So uh, we'll, we'll be having that book at some of the sessions after the election. So again, thanks for all of you being here. It's interesting that it's uh, the beginning of the Jewish New Year. It's the end of Ramadan. It's the beginning of September, which always seems to be a month when uh, interesting things happen. I'm, I'm sorry, the beginning of the month of October when very interesting things seem to happen in the history of uh, the markets of the United States. So, and it's the beginning of the fiscal year. So uh, it's a, September 30th is a prescient day. Um, a month ago, uh, if someone had told me that the United States would step in and purchase a large insurance conglomerate and take a 70 to 80 percent ownership stake in it, I would have said that that politically would not have been possible. Um, so things are rapidly changing. The uh, sands, the political moment is changing. And I think we're fortunate to have three terrific economic thinkers to help us grasp, grapple with the current situation. Uh, yesterday, a number of us sat in this room and watched the congressional debate. And I don't know if some of you watched it. It was fascinating. I particularly was interested to see uh, Republican congressmen and women get up, and I thought we were, uh, re uh, they were channeling uh, Williams Jennings Bryan or something. It was like 1890, the populists, they were railing against Wall Street and greed, uh, and it was, uh, it, it seemed to, to d divine a new uh, political moment. Um, and I think that we'll talk about yesterday's vote and what it means, but clearly the blowback against the Bush bailout plan has a lot to do with the deep distrust that ordinary Americans feel for Wall Street and the concentrations of wealth and power that have emerged over the last decade, at two decades. The Institute for Policy Studies has been very involved in this bailout debate. We've been involved in, in the terms around uh, the caps on executive pay. Uh, we've been proposing ways for Wall Street to pay for it to, through taxation of the actual speculators. Um, We've been putting forward uh, just this morning a fair, a four-point plan for a uh, fair bailout that includes a Main Street recovery and uh, forcing Wall Street to pay the costs of cleaning up the mess, uh, eliminating profiteering from the process of whatever bailout emerges. Uh, so some of those points uh, we can talk about later, but that's at our website at www.ips-dc.org. So let's get into our discussion, um, and let me tell you the format. Uh, with us today, we have Barbara Ehrenreich, Dean Baker, and Jared Bernstein. I'll introduce them a little bit more, but what we're going to do is do two rounds uh, of just questions to them, and then we'll open it up for discussion. And the first round is, is really uh, tied to the, the current, the, the events of the moment, which is um, what's your sense of what's happening? What is the... Uh, how did we get to this point where we have Congress uh, with the markets plummeting se over 700 points, uh, with Congress debating a $700 billion bailout? How did we get to this point? 
Uh, is this proposed bailout necessary? Uh, is there a link to these economic inequalities that has contributed to this current economic instability? And what should be done? So what I'm going to do is ask each of our speakers to address that for five to eight minutes. And then we'll come back and we'll do a second run through looking at the question of what does this mean for the national elections coming up and the current uh, political moment. So first I'd like to uh, introduce Dean Baker, who is the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research uh, here in Washington, D.C. He, prior to that, was a senior economist at the Economic Policy Institute and an associate professor at Bucknell. Uh, he has a terrific blog called Beat the Press, and he has been one of the people who's been tracking this bailout, who's been putting forward some thoughtful positions on it. I should say going back years, Dean has been one of the voices in the wilderness talking about this uh, $10 trillion housing bubble and raving, ra waving the red flag and trying to get people to pay attention to it. So um, we're very fortunate that Dean could be with us. I think he's been doing, probably done 100 interviews in the last two days. Uh, so we're very fortunate that, um, please welcome Dean Baker. Thanks. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to be here. A great time to be here, a great topic to talk on. And I originally thought we were going to talk about health care when this first got arranged. Not quite. Um, anyhow, this, uh, this really has been extra is an extraordinary time to quote, I don't know who has been attributed to just about everyone I know of, but, you know, the world is in turmoil, the future looks bright. Um, I, th I think we do have a lot of opportunities on the table, which we'll get to, but the first thing is to understand where we are and not to give away the store. Um, in understanding where we are, again, I'll hit on the, my one note, housing bubble, housing bubble, housing bubble. Um, if you don't understand the housing bubble, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, we had a 8 to $10 trillion housing bubble over the decade from 96 to 2006. House prices mo rose by more than 80 percent by one measure, 100 percent in excess of inflation. Over the prior 100 years, 1895 to 1995, house prices had just kept even with inflation. This should have been real simple. In other words, every economist who you know, does this for a living should have been able to look at those numbers and go, housing bubble, housing bubble, housing bubble. But I could tell you, every economist I talked to, with very few exceptions, didn't. That includes the economists who no longer work for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who I debated many times and insisted house prices never fall. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have now fallen. Um, you know, this, that was the core problem. That is the core problem. The house prices peaked in, in 2006. They've since fallen by close to 20 percent in nominal terms, close to 30 percent in real terms, probably a bit more than halfway down in terms of how far they have to go. This is destroyed on the order to four to five trillion dollars in housing wealth. That comes to about sixty to seventy thousand dollars for every homeowner in the country. Why are we in a recession? Why are we in a crisis? You get rid of sixty to seventy thousand dollars of wealth for every homeowner in the country. You shouldn't have to ask any questions. That gives you a recession. That gives you a crisis. That's the basic story. That also gives you a financial crisis because housing is a highly leveraged asset. We used to buy homes with ten percent or twenty percent down. In 03, 04, 05, 06, people bought homes with zero down. So the fact that the financial system's in a crisis, well, you lose, you know, four to five trillion dollars in wealth that's that's in a highly leveraged asset that gives you a financial crisis. That's the basic story. Um, question two here: Is it linked to inequality? Absolutely. I'm writing a book about the bubble economy, the the rise and fall of the bubble economy. Um, over, you know, there's a bit of a caricature, but in the early post-war period, we had growth that was broadly shared, and you sort of had a had a story where, you know, everyone gained at the same time. Firms did very well. You know, the stock market did well. Corporate profits did well. What they did was they reinvested. That raised productivity. That raised people's wages because they got productivity. The, their wage increases reflected productivity growth. They spent more. That led to more investment. You had this healthy, virtuous cycle. In the 80s, 90s, and the current decade, basically wages through most of that period did not keep pace with productivity growth. Instead, what drove the economy were financial bubbles. We had a financial bubble in the 90s, the stock market, and we had a financial bubble in this decade, the housing market. So to a certain extent, we, these are alternative mechanisms to drive the economy. On the other hand, you could, on the one hand, you could have wage consumption-driven growth. That was what we did in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, into the 70s. On the other hand, you could have bubble-driven growth. That's what we have in the 90s and this decade. Those, to me, are two very, very different routes. So I think inequality is a huge chunk of the story. Um, is the bailout necessary? Um, I would say, you know, all the people who say it's necessary, I'd say, for what? And that usually shuts them up. 
Um, you know, President Bush has been incredibly irresponsible running out talking about the Great Depression. I heard it this morning. Uh, he was out there saying, look how much the stock market fell. It's going to fall even more if you don't, you know, if you don't pass the bailout. It's close to nuts. I mean, you know, this, this deserves to be laughed at. There is a very serious problem here. Running around talking about the Great Depression is not serious. This is just silly scare tactics. And it reflects the contempt that these people have for the, for the public. I have to tell you, I was out there celebrating yesterday. I wasn't celebrating too much because there had a lot of press to talk to. But it was a great moment because the public overwhelmingly is opposed to this bailout. The elite is almost unanimously in favor of it. The, pub, the elite has absolute contempt for the public. They're going, their emotions got carried away with them. They thought this was, you know, a handout to Wall Street. Well, guess what? The public is exactly right. The elites don't know what they're talking about. They let their emotions get carried away with them. They don't know what, what bad thing will happen if we don't do the bailout tomorrow, Thursday, before Congress goes away, we don't do it for a month. What will happen? None of them could tell you. They all know it's supposed to be really, really bad. But none of them could tell you because they don't know, and quite frankly, there might be nothing bad that happens. We're in a recession. We're in a recession because we lost 4 to $5 trillion in housing bubble wealth. The financial markets are absolutely strained. Some big banks have gone under. Many more almost certainly will. But from the standpoint of the public and from that vantage point, the standpoint of the economy, we don't need the big banks. That's not our problem. We need a working financial system. And if a bank goes under, you know, we just had Wachovia, or not Wachovia, Washington Mutual, one of the biggest banks in the country, just went under. My guess is no one knew that their bank went under. In other words, if you had a deposit at Washington Mutual, you probably didn't know. It was taken over, you know, it was passed on. You probably didn't know. You know, you got a note in the mail a couple of days later. You know, your deposit's now over with, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Citigroup that bought them up. You know, nothing happened. We could keep the financial system operating. That's what we care about. The fact that banks go under... That's bad news for the bank executives, who get paid tens of millions of dollars, by the way. It's bad news for the shareholders who are going to lose all their money in those banks. For the rest of us, we have no particular interest in that. And when you look at the bailout, you could have designed, this is a horribly designed bail, bailout from the get-go. I don't know a single economist who thought that was a way to design a bailout. But you could have taken this one and fixed it so that it wasn't enriching the executives on Wall Street. It wasn't enriching the shareholders. They didn't do that. It was a joke. These, are, these were sorts of the provisions put in there were sorts of things you give to children. These were not serious provisions. The, the executive compensation caps, what I said about those is any executive who couldn't get around those caps should be fired. <laughs> you know, this was not serious. The equity provisions, when Warren Buffett bu puts up $5 billion for Goldman Sachs, he gets a 10% stake. He doesn't get a statement, you'll get equity. This is a joke. I mean, these are joke provisions. You know, and, and it was just an insult to the American people. Everything about this was an insult to the American people. So there is serious stress in the financial system. We should try to do something about it. Is there an urgency? Well, just to be very concrete, we're facing a recession. We're losing jobs, not because of the financial crisis. That makes it worse. But we're losing jobs. We're in a recession because we lost four to five trillion in housing wealth. We'll probably lose another three to four trillion in housing wealth. Would I like to see something done with the financial system? Yes. Would I like to see a big stimulus to the economy? Yes. If we don't have a financial stimulus in this week, this month, I'm sorry, a financial fix this week, this month, is that bad? Yeah. If we don't have a fiscal stimulus this week, this month, is that bad? Yeah. Which is worse? Probably the lack of a fiscal stimulus. So in terms of getting the economy back in order, first and foremost, we are going to need some fiscal stimulus. If that's shut off, by the way, by this financial deal, this bailout, that's a real, real bad deal. The fiscal stimulus is much more needed. Secondly, we do have to fix the financial system. My view is go back to the drawing board, try and do it right. If that's not acceptable, fine, because, you know, the losers in this story are the Wall Street banks. I, I wrote a piece yesterday. I said, what's going on here is they have a gun pointed at their head, and they're trying to tell us that if we don't give them $700 billion, they're going to pull the trigger. And I'm willing to live with that. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Thank you, Dean. That's terrific. Um, our second speaker is Barbara Ehrenreich. Uh, she is an author. She's also a senior scholar here at the Institute for Policy Studies and a trustee. She's the author of the best-selling book, Nickel and Dimed. And her new book is called This Land is Our Land. No, their land. This land, <laughs> that was the Woody Guthrie saying, this land is their land, note reports from a divided nation. Uh, please welcome Barbara Ehrenreich. I had, uh, 
made some notes uh, for today, yesterday afternoon at 1 o'clock, and put them aside, and <laughs> <laughs> then I started all over again this morning, uh, perhaps a little apocalyptically, but um, it's worth observing that this year, 2008, is the 160th anniversary of the Communist Manifesto. And uh, capitalism seems to be uh, observing the occasion, at least seemed anyway for a while yesterday, by dropping dead, um, which is not something to rejoice in because we don't exactly have an alternative <laughs> handy. Um, and a lot of us are going to be crushed as those huge uh, glass bank buildings fall on us. Uh, I, I mean, I started thinking this last night because uh, there I was surfing channels to see what people were thinking about the day's events. and get to hear words that you don't usually hear on television. Capitalism, socialism, even Karl Marx. Now this, as far as I know, is not how Marx and Engels expected to see capitalism uh, brought down. They wanted something more proactive. They wanted angry workers fed up with low wages uh, to rise up against the, the powerful the economic elites. Now, in one way, of course, um, Marx was very right. Uh, he predicted the polarization, the economic polarization of our society. You know, that the rich would get richer, that the gap would grow and grow and grow. And the United States, by the way, if you don't know it, is the most economically polarized of the industrial countries. And Marx also predicted very well the immiseration, as he called it, of the working class the growing hardships of the working class. And we have seen that. Uh, we have uh, an estimated 25 to 30 percent of Americans uh, working but not being able to make ends meet, the so-called working poor. We've had stagnant and declining wages, as Dean mentioned. Uh, often the flip side of great fortunes, like the Walmart, the $80 billion Walmart family fortune. And of course, we have uh, a lack of some of the most basic services, uh, such as health care or any safety net. Uh, welfare has been eliminated, et cetera. Now, many of us, and uh, Chuck, uh, with his book among them, you know, have had strong moral objections to this situation, this very polarized society with so many people uh, living constantly uh, in great difficulty and in, in pain. But you know, from a very detached economic perspective, it seemed to work. Uh, there was, you know, I remember David Brooks saying in the New York Times, not within the last year, inequality is not an issue that ordinary people worry about. It's just something that liberals or intellectuals or something uh, worry about. But there is, you know, one key thing that was propping up this entire unjust and uh, uh, situation, and someone would say immoral situation, and that thing propping it up all along has been easy credit. Uh, car loans, student loans, credit cards, uh, and of course um, in the last few years mortgages, the, the most peculiar sorts of mortgages like ninja mortgages, mortgages for people with no income, no job, and no assets, um, subprime mortgages, etc. directed at precisely that 30% of our population that can't make ends meet. Now, easy credit made the whole thing keep going somehow. It was our substitute in this country for decent wages. And until about 14 months ago, this all seemed to be a kind of sustainable situation. Then, in August 2007, some people in places like Cleveland and Detroit found they couldn't make their monthly mortgage payments. Uh, they had medical bills. Uh, they had car problems. They had just lost their jobs, and those mortgage payments went by. These kinds of things that cause defaults on mortgages are, you know, these are everyday emergencies for so many Americans, but they were the kind of thing that the masters of the universe, as they have been called, living in their bubbles of extreme wealth could never have imagined. It's just not in their world to imagine a person, be a family being derailed uh, by transmission problems, for example. Uh, so 
you know, when the, as we know, when those, quote, little people, the so-called ordinary people, and I hate that expression, defaulted last summer, the whole system internationally showed signs of weakness. Now, last week, the administration, um, you know, uh, demanded this uh, bailout. It was striking. They did not demand a bailout of people who are losing their homes due to foreclosure. They did not uh, call for a bailout of people who are being swallowed up by <laughs> debt. They did not uh, call for a uh, bailout of people who can't put enough food on the table anymore. But a bailout instead of Wall Street, um, which to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, looked like one last great upward redistribution of wealth coming from the Bush administration. I'm mystified by the Democratic support of the bailout uh, and their hard work on it. I'm gratified that a populist majority of Congress rejected it. I am, however, dismayed by the presidential candidate's um, behavior, really, or responses in the last week. McCain, I don't have to say anything about. I mean, he lost it. His behavior has been erratic, manic. Uh, you know, it, it's crazy. But Obama, um, I was disappointed he brushed aside a chance to change the bankruptcy law so people facing foreclosure could renegotiate their mortgages. Obvious thing to do. Uh, today he's come out with what I think is a kind of lame suggestion that the FDIC insure people's deposits up to 250000 which is fine if you have 250000 but I don't think that gets to the heart of the problem. Um, anyway, to wind up and return to... Um, Marx, whose Communist Manifesto this, this is the anniversary of. One thing I think he was fundamentally right about, and that is that change has to come from below. It has to come from the people who are hurt and hurting, the people forced facing foreclosure, the people working themselves to exhaustion on two or more jobs, uh, the small business owners who cannot make it anymore at all. Uh, we need, and we've been saying it for a long time, but we need a mass movement for economic justice and it should cut across the lines of the working poor and the former middle class. Um, the aim will probably not be socialism, it certainly is Marx saw it, but it certainly will not be anything like what we have known as, quote, free enterprise either. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Um, our next speaker is Jared Bernstein, and uh, Jared is uh, an economist at the Economic Policy Institute where he directs their program on living standards. He's the author. His most recent book is called Crunch, Why Do I Feel Squeezed? And his previous book is called All Together Now, Common Sense for a Fair Economy. Um, Jared. Well, thank you, uh, Chuck, and thank you to Karen over there. And uh, it's great to be here with my good friends, uh, Barbara and Dean, with whom I go uh, pretty far back, so that's, that's nice. <clears throat> a discussion of economic inequality, market instability in the 2008 presidential race strikes me as a very ambitious agenda. Uh, I'll bite off a couple of the questions that Chuck raised uh, briefly and, uh, look and, and, and say more in round two. Uh, so uh, I was concerned when Karen asked me to do this that I would just be um, – parroting a lot of what you've already heard from my fellow panel members, and uh, there may be some of that, uh, but I, in some ways I think my concerns are more prosaic than, uh, than Dean's and Barbara's, uh, though I agree, uh, agree with a lot of, of what I heard. Um, the moment that we're in is, for me, just uh, – oh, sorry, louder, please. <coughs> uh, the moment uh, – can everyone hear me? Uh, that we're in is truly head-spinning. I mean, every – time you open you wake up and open the newspaper or log on you're wondering what what other shoe is there to drop uh it's the collision of so many powerful forces the fail out, the fallout from the housing bubble dean described the ongoing recession uh which uh, i think bailout or not uh, uh will deepen uh the credit crunch which i think is real and i'm going to present some concerns about in a minute um the elections which are pu putting uh, uh, uh their own 
thumbprints on these outcomes. Remember, all these Congress, uh, all these House members are are up for re-election. Uh, and uh, coming uh, on top of an historically imbalanced recovery with great inequalities embedded in it. I mean, the fact is that, that households are uniquely, middle-income and low-income households, are uniquely uninsulated from the kind of economic... Uh, uh, headwinds that they're facing right now. I'm, fe I'm sure folks in this audience know this, but poverty was actually uh, considerably higher in 2007 than it was in 2000. And for the for the first time on record, uh, the income of the median uh, family was uh, uh, unchanged over this business cycle, a period of, of, of fairly uh, strong productivity growth. So uh, you're starting, and this is all pre- bursting housing bubble recession. This is, this is uh, um, over a period when the economy was allegedly uh, uh, doing well. And, and in, in, as I said, by indicators from 40,000 feet up, whether it's inflation or industrial production or productivity, it was doing well on the ground, uh, uh, much worse. Um, so that's the backdrop. Now, uh, it's not surprising that the original Paulson plan was, was pilloried, and I'll talk a little bit about the motivation for that. Um, I won't go into that unless people are interested. Lots was, was you know, everything was wrong with that, and including his uh, really terrible salesmanship. I agree with uh, others who've, who've mentioned that. Uh, he kind of came out swinging like he was still the chief of Goldman Sachs, just entering the uh, staff meeting saying, here's what we're going to do, and that, that didn't work out very well for him. Um, the politics of the week, though, I thought did lead to improvements uh, in the bill, though I agree that they were... They were uh, somewhat marginal. Um, ultimately, the bill that failed yesterday was attacked from, from all sides, and many of the critiques resonated. Um, on the right, you heard a lot of, uh, oh, why not let market discipline do its thing? I mean, this is, uh, let's not go down the socialist path. Uh, uh, we're we're, we're going to you know, become French if we do that. And so uh, uh, let market discipline just uh, have its way with, with these folks. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we could have a good discussion about when um, uh, conservative political act actors are invoking market discipline and when, they, uh, and when they're not. Uh, but at any rate, that was certainly one of the critiques of yesterday's plan. Um, but I had others. Why $700 billion? That was never made clear, I think. Uh, I think there was some discourse about uh, uh, Treasury was looking for a number that was between half a trillion and a trillion, and 700 almost gets you there. Um, is this the best bang for the buck? Uh, is is buying these 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 uh, uh, troubled assets, taking hold of them, and you know, crossing your fingers and hoping that they they appreciate and we can sell them back at a at a profit to the taxpayer? Uh, is, is that is that a good idea? Uh, and uh, many of us uh, thought not, compared to better alternatives. And why not go to the heart of the problem and intervene directly in housing markets, since that's really where the problem lies? So these are some of the critiques that that have been made of the Paulson plan that per, uh, uh, potentially we'll, we'll keep arguing about depending on where things go. Uh, my answers are that um, uh, I'm all for market discipline um, except the time to worry about moral hazard and uh, the idea here is if, if you fail to impose market discipline you invoke moral hazard that is economic actors don't face the true cost of their activity so they end up behaving in, in risky ways. The time to worry about moral hazard is not the weekend when the bank's failing or the economy is allegedly on, on a precipice. The time to worry about that is years before when you're writing the rules of the road and the regulations that are supposed to preclude precisely the kind of speculative excess we've been seeing. So to wring your hands right now and say uh, um, invoke market discipline, uh, you might get a victory, but my fear is that it would be a pyrrhic one. Um, the Paulson plan struck me as illogical in a fundamental way. The only way to recapitalize the banks under the Paulson plan such that they could start lending again and achieve this goal of, of thawing credit markets was to pay a very significant premium over the market value of these depreciated assets, these troubled loans. So you kind of go in there as the taxpayer and you play, pay this inflated uh, value. Um, uh, there are more direct ways to do that, such as the... Uh, uh, um, a Buffett direct equity buy. That's the idea that you actually directly, uh, uh, the government directly buys equity from, uh, from these firms and recapitalizes them uh, more directly without owning the lousy paper. But then there's this big question, and that's probably where, you know, my, maybe I, I have a, uh, uh, I don't know if my view is different than my colleagues here, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, um, you know, is there time to craft a better plan and uh, treat uh, uh, the illness uh, the underlying illness here, which is 
uh, the, the housing uh, issues Dean spoke about or versus the symptoms, which is a, a, uh, the threat of a severe credit crunch. Um, so the question there is basically this is the question of, uh, you know, how much, how urgent is this situation? How quickly do we need to uh, intervene uh, in credit markets with the hope that uh, we um, uh, get them lending again, um, because the threat from our economic authorities, which I agree has been hugely uh, overplayed in many ways, um, is that if we don't, you know, lots of really bad things will start happening. Well, first of all, the Dow Jones is not the right indicator. Anyone who's looking at that every day and asking themselves, is the plan working, is it not working, appeasing the markets, uh, you know, basing your policy agenda on appeasing uh, the, the stock markets like you know, following around a deeply manic depressive person as your personal role model. Um, that's just not, not the way to go forward. Um, and I also agree, I think Dean said this, that, you know, failing banks, that's, that's not a good thing, but it's not destabilizing. The thing that I'm worried about, and I, I, I'm not saying by any means that this is a certainty, these are probabilistic events, and where you put the probability at this time, unfortunately, is, is more guts than, than, than data. But the thing that I'm worried about is, is, is businesses um, really suffocating for lack of oxygen in terms of a short-term credit. Uh, we're not a cash economy anymore, and uh, businesses depend on short-term lines of credit to restock their inventories, to make their payrolls, to finance their daily operations. And there is no good real-time indicator of the extent to which, uh, uh, or there aren't enough really good time indicators of the extent to which we're, we're, we're really at the edge of such a precipice where uh, deserving uh, businesses will um, uh, uh, go out of uh, a business because they can't get uh, uh, the credit they need. And, and, and then you go from, not recession to depression, I totally agree with, the, with Dean, but then you go to uh, recession to deeper, much longer recession with a lot of unnecessary pain that uh, uh, we, we might be able to do something about. Here's a quote from Business Week who wrote an article about this. And by the way, it's a very balanced article that I recommend in a recent uh, Business Week uh, about, you know, the extent to which there really is a credit crunch. In Ohio, banks are refusing to re renew lines of credit and calling in loans made to decades-old family businesses that uh, are current on payments. Uh, this guy knows about this stuff out there, says it's the worst borrowing environment he's seen in 20 years. The pullback began in 2008 and accelerated in the last four or five months. They're pulling the triggers and saying you're done. It's not just sick businesses. These are healthy businesses, and that's the surprising thing. And I started last, you know, a week from today when I heard this hyperbole, I wasn't that worried about this kind of scenario. Now I'm a lot more worried about it. Uh, the uh, one measure of this, uh, of the extent of, 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 of uh, credit market tautness is something called the TED spread, which is really a measure of how um, uh, easy it is for um, uh, businesses to get short-term loans. That's uh, at a, uh, uh, an historically hugely elevated level. It's around 3.5 percentage points. It's the difference between the, the rate at which uh, banks loan short-term commercial paper to each other and the safest investment, which is a three-month uh, treasury b uh, uh, bond. The difference in those yields right now is 3.5 percentage points. Usually the TED spread runs at around 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So that's, that's flashing uh, uh, very tight credit markets. Um, I have here, here's my, uh, my, my uh, faux PowerPoint, uh, if you see this top graph, um, which I then even circled the little uptick. This is the net percentage of, of domestic respondents tightening credit standards for consumer and investor loans. This is from a survey of banks, and it just says how many banks are saying, you know, we're really tightening up loan standards, which is exactly what you'd want them to do, especially in mortgage markets right now. But actually, if you, you see this is just almost an asymptotically uh, 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 creeping up uh, slope there. And, and, and so you might say, well, that's just mortgage markets. But in fact, if you look at it for consumer loans, again, same thing, just uh, uh, almost a, a curve going straight, straight up. So, you know, no question that credit has tightened. An open question as to whether the cataclysm of, of deserving business is failing because uh, for, for lack of oxygen, that's an open question. But that is something to be, to be scared of and to be worried about and to be uh, considering um, uh, uh, a, a, a systemic intervention in uh, versus the weekend adventures of, uh, of Hank and uh, 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 Ben where you kind of go into a, a, a Lehman or a, um, an AIG and look at the books and decide, uh, okay, uh, you, you get saved, you don't. Um, I'll finish up in a second. Uh, 
Um, I told you that I think there are better plans out there. Uh, um, well, let me just see. Uh, you know, I think the so just finishing up my first uh, uh, installment here then is is. It's key to remember that this is coming on the heels of a uniquely unrewarding recovery. There are over 770,000 jobs lost in the recession in the private sector so far. Um, real weekly earnings are down 2.5% over the past year, uh, uh, and that's a combination of job loss, slower wage growth, high prices. So on, on, on top of this recovery that I uh, decided early, now we've hit uh, this recession, and uh, at the same time, you, you're, you're, you've heard about the, the wealth constraints that, that folks are facing. So, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the wrap of a, of a deeply dismal scientist and, I, and hopefully adding uh, some warning signs to what I think is a, is a true concern about uh, a potential uh, meltdowns in, uh, potential seizures in, in credit markets. But I, too, not unlike others here, I think, well, I, I don't know about Barbara, but I don't want to put words in her mouth, but like Dean, you know, I believe there's a, an important silver lining here. And I'll get to that next. <laughs> Great. About your graphs? Yeah. Thank you, Jared. Um, so rounds two. Yeah. Let me let me just say. So uh, what we're going to do is is, uh, is kind of do an, a couple minutes each just on sort of. So what does this mean in terms of the political implications, the current uh, environment leading up to the election in less than 40 days, and also a chance for our speakers to comment on each other. Then we'll open it up to questions first from the working press and then from everyone else here. So, Dean. All right, I'll be very quick. Just a couple points. Um, obviously, the politics, uh, you know, the, the one thing I'll say is we are really, really lucky this is happening a month before the election rather than a month after. Um, <laughs> there is a God. Um, uh, okay, the credit tightening, I, I may take Jared's, you know, points very seriously because I've been arguing with people all along, and they're, they're definitely tightening a credit. But let me just, uh, we have our fake PowerPoint here, and, you know, credit's tightening, percentage of people are tightening credit. Look back here. Was that the end of the world in uh, 2001? Was that the end of the world in 1990? That's what happens in recessions. Okay, so somehow when it's happened now, it's the end of the world. I have a friend who's a realtor. I bumped into in the dog park yesterday. I said, you know, you have any problems? He goes, we had, uh, I had six closings last week, 10% down, 6% mortgages. Last time I got a home, I paid 7.15 on my mortgage. Um, you know, the, the point uh, Jared's making, I know it's a common use, the, the, the spread, the TED spread, the gap between the interbank lending rate and the Treasury rate, and that's really high now because the Treasury rate is unbelievably low. But the interbank lending rate is about 4%. That's historically very low. That's not killing credit. And I was just on a show a little while ago, and the guy's going, what do you mean there's not credit tightening, you know, that there's not a credit crisis? You know, United and General Motors say that they might have to go out of business. I go, you know, they have some other problems. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, so, so there's, I mean, we're being given a sales pitch here. You have to look through and think through it carefully. Now, I'll just say a couple other points because I want everyone else to have a chance to talk. I, I don't know if I emphasize this, but you can't emphasize it enough. The people who are selling us this, the people who are talking to us like we're little kids, you know, President Bush, Henry Paulson, Ben Bernanke, they missed it. We're in this crisis because they missed it. It really takes some nerve to people who totally messed up their job to come out and talk to us like we're idiots. And that's what's going on. I have to say, I find that a little bit annoying because it's totally because they missed it that we're, they didn't do their jobs. Otherwise, we, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. And the last point, this is, again, a huge danger of this. Um, not that they're right, but, you know, they're already, these guys are foaming at the mouth. The Washington Post editorial board, you know, the, the, the Wall Street Finance, Pete Peterson Foundation, even Jim Lehrer said this. They said, if we have this bailout, the $700 billion bailout, we're going to have to cut back, mm -hmm. you know. Now, that's garbage, and the reason why it's garbage, it'll take me a little while to explain it, but basically it's not the same as if we spent $700 billion on the war in Iraq. It's an asset swap. We're going to lose money on it. I don't want any illusions of that. If we send $700 billion out the door, we'll be lucky if $350 billion comes back. But that's not the same as if we spent $700 on, on the war in Iraq. And they're misrepresenting that, but the point here is that they're going to use this as an argument against both existing social spending and any future stimulus. And, if you, again, just to deal with that question, which do I consider more important, a serious stimulus to give a boost to the economy or $700 billion to keep these guys on Wall Street happy? It doesn't take a second. Barbara. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, I, this is, I'm here just, you know, as a courtesy because I'm not a real economist mm -hmm. uh, like they are. I'm just pretending to be one right now. Um, but uh, so I, I have a question. I think there is a, a difference in 
what I emphasize versus what you emphasize, Dean, and, and I don't know the answer here, but how much, you know, you emphasize the housing bubble as the, what precipitated all this. I emphasize the growing inequality and the fact that we had, um, have a, a poverty population that couldn't buy houses even at pre-bubble prices. You know, and that this, that, that inequality, um, you know, has been there for a long time, was seen as some sort of a quaint aspect of America. You know, other countries are more equal, but we, we have these, you know, fantastic contrasts and it's very colorful and everything like that um, about America. Well, you know, what I, I've been saying, and I, I'm willing to stand corrected here, but what I've been saying in many settings is that the tolerance of that degree of, of poverty in America is, you know, that de and that poverty itself became a tripwire for the economy. Because here were people who would never, for example, earn enough, be paid enough to buy a house, but there were plenty of banks willing to come around or, or mortgage companies willing to say, hey, we got a mortgage for you. <laughs> you know, that, that was the tripwire. So I would like some uh, clarification because uh, it, it seems to me, my guess is that there's not a whole lot we can do about the bursting of the bubble. Right? I mean, no. that's just, oh, that no. value no. was yeah. crazy, you know, it, it, it burst and it's gone. But, um, but if we are going to intervene at this point with something, some multi-billion dollar uh, form of intervention, that it should be targeting that other problem, the degree of poverty and economic pain in this country. You know, that, and, and yet all, throughout this process in the last week or so, anybody who stands on the sidelines and says, hey, what about helping people who are facing foreclosure? Or somebody in the Washington Post yesterday saying, what about rising levels of hunger? You know, all of, the, all of them are made to feel like they're just, you know, standing um, on the street with tin cups held up mm -hmm. while this, you know, stampede of guys in pinstripes goes by saying, no, we got to have money, we got to have money right now. <laughs> and it just... You know, I, I, I correct me then if, the, if there's something wrong with my logic here, but I would say if there are hundreds of billions of dollars uh, left over after tax cuts for the rich, after the wars in Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan, then this is a time to address the shame of so much poverty uh, and hardship in America. Dean, do you want to do a quick question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just say certainly I would love to, I mean, again, this is a good reason not to hand $700 billion to Wall Street. And, again, I, you know, there are serious credit problems or serious issues with the banking system. Those could be addressed in ways that don't reward the people who got us into this mess. Now, in terms of the, the housing bubble, you know, this is, you know, I'd say a broader issue. Certainly, you know, it's the people at the bottom, but also the people at the middle. And, you know, I trace this, again, my hero, Alan Greenspan, we had a recession 2001, 2002, continued into 2003, at least in terms of losing jobs. I mean, officially the recession ends November 2001, but we're shedding jobs till the, the fall of 2003. Greenspan goes, well, the economy is flat on its back. What can I do? Well, he lowers interest rates to 1%, and he deliberately fosters a housing bubble. He went out of his way. I first started looking at this because he said there is no housing bubble. And to my view, the only reason that makes sense was that was the only thing moving in the economy. So we didn't have wage-led growth. Wages were nowhere. We didn't have consumption-led growth. The only thing moving was the housing market. Now, that was pushing up prices across the board. As you get house prices going up, you get, you know, Greenspan's phrase, irrational exuberance. So you had, you know, the countrywides, the new centuries, throwing money with these predatory loans at people that, you know, they, they knew couldn't afford them, at least not the resets. They knew they were going to get in trouble. They didn't care. They could dump them in the secondary market. Everyone's happy. Everyone's making money on it as long as house prices keep going up. So I'd say it's part of it. It's sort of like, you know, going back to the stock bubble. I was yelling about stock bubble in 97, 98, but it didn't really get totally crazy till 99 and 2000 when you had 20-year-old kids with their, you know, garbage.com and you had investors go, oh, here's a billion dollars. You know, so, so this was kind of the internet of the, you know, the housing bubble where you had just the extreme excesses. It wasn't quite as funny because it wasn't 20-year-old kids. It was people with families who were now out on the street. Jared, before you jump in, let me just, just make a comment that ties into that, sure. which is I think from the perspective of the growing inequality of wealth, there's both what's happening to people at the bottom, but there, there's this dynamic that the, the, the richest one-tenth of one percent, their share of wealth has dramatically increased over the last 30 years. And when people sit down and look at, well, what are we going to do with our wealth, they say, well, we'll put some of it in secure investments and insured deposits, but then we're going to take this other chunk of our wealth 
and put it into the casino because we want 15% returns and 20% returns and 30% returns. So where do you find those kinds of returns? You find them in high risk, high return uh, ventures. And the, the growth of the hedge fund, private equity market, the derivative, derivative market, all have corresponded to the fact that there's this enormous concentration of wealth seeking high return investments. So the speculation dynamic is very much a function of these great inequalities. So I think uh, part of the program is, we should, you know, when people talk about a Main Street bailout, things, investments that actually would uh, directly stimulate people in the real economy, address people who are being losing their homes, uh, that, that some of that should be paid for by highly, steeply progressive taxes on the top one-tenth of one percent, very high income taxes, high wealth taxes, as a way to both address, find where's the money going to come from to pay for the stimulus, but also let's get at the root cause of how these concentrations of wealth create instability. I mean, the last time wealth was this unequal was 1928. Too much inequality creates instability in the economy. So that's a perspective I think that we here at the Institute for Policy Studies have been grappling. It's part of the story of what's happened. Um, but let's let's hear from Jared both any thoughts on this sure, and then your sure, no, and your listen. sense of the politics of this, how this is going to play out. Uh, sorry, I keep my head on the table. Uh, those are great points, uh, Chuck. Uh, I, I I agree I agree with you, and it's in, it's not and. and uh, uh, I think it's um, – well, I'll get back to that. Um, I, I just wanted to be clear about this, uh, you know, maybe somewhat different uh, way of – different degree of nervousness about about this between Dean and I. Uh, um, it's not that I think Paulson and Bernanke and especially Bush <laughs> are right in saying that um, – we're headed off a cliff. It's that uh, over the course of the week, uh, I became worried about the extent to which they might be right. Uh, and, and by right, I mean a very specific thing. Not that financial markets are in the tank. Not that banks are failing. Uh, I know that. Um, that, uh, you know, businesses are starved for the credit they need to keep operations going day to day. And I, I don't know that that's happening. It's at the level of anecdote. You know, there was a, a car dealership in where I live in Northern Virginia that apparently was a victim of this. Um, now, it's a car dealership. Uh, so, uh, as we said, uh, cars are a tough business right now. So there are a lot of moving parts to this. I mean, if it's not just the levels uh, that I'm concerned about here, uh, as Dean was saying. It's the slope. It's the, this is, by the way, again, this is an increase in the rate at which uh, banks are tightening their standard, loan standards. And this, this is almost a lot, this is consumer loans. This is almost going straight up. And so there's reasons to be nervous that banks aren't lending to each other and that, and that lines of credit that are typically open to firms are, are shut down. Does that mean we have to rush in to a bad plan and, and, and you know, waste a lot of money? Absolutely not. But my point is that that's the indicator to watch not the Dow Jones. Um, okay, now, I said there was a silver lining to this, and I, I, I make it a point not to be uh, uh, just uh, horribly dismal everywhere I go, uh, and it ain't easy. Um, uh, but uh, I wrote a piece for the Huffington Post called Watching History Unfold, and, and in that piece I tried to um, write down a bunch of uh, things I think this debacle teaches us. And it's up to groups like IPS, who've, who've just been a, a, a true leader in this regard, and EPI and CEPR, to figure out a way to make these lessons last. And if we don't, then our bad isn't the right phrase. It's much worse than that. If we don't tap this moment to learn these lessons and to implement them in, in, in politics and elections, then uh, uh, we've missed a, a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And I'll just read them very quickly. Deregulated markets cannot police themselves. They tend towards speculation, vastly underpriced risk, and deeply damaging bubbles. An economy that generates growth while leaving most families behind is a broken economy. We can neither achieve broad prosperity nor compete globally with robust, without robust growth in key sectors which we have ignored or underfunded, including manufacturing, green production, and cradle to retirement public education. Crafting ever more clever financial instruments will not pave the way to dependable, broadly shared growth. No private sector firm should be too big to fail. Any firm of that magnitude must be nationalized. Capital markets are dysfunctional. Borrowing and lending standards are ignored. Lax capital requirements lead to constant over-leveraging. Shadow accounts thwart transparency. 
we apparently can quickly find or borrow the money to do the stuff the authorities deem necessary, be it a war or a bailout. Thus, we can also find the money we need for investment in people, from health care to education to infrastructure. Supply-side trickle-down economics does not work. It exacerbates already excessive levels of market-driven inequalities and defunds government, which leads to, next point, clearly we need government to be amply funded. As is the case today, we'll always turn to the federal government to meet the toughest challenges we face, and if the money isn't there, we'll borrow it from the futures. This means taxes cannot only be lowered, sometimes they must be raised. For decades, under the spell of mainstream theories like rational expectations, which is how it means bubbles can't form because prices can't diverge from reality for too long, economists and policymakers, this is a point Dean made, and he's a stalwart in this area, Economists and policymakers have missed almost every big market failure, including the last two bubbles in IT and housing. Government intervention is only distortionary in these models, adding the anti-government bias since Reagan. We desperately need policymakers and their economists to be much better analysts of markets and how they fail. It's not an exaggeration to state that much of what's gone wrong in the current case could have been avoided by better oversight, common sense, regulation, and clear-eyed analysis of economic indicators that should not have been missed. Now, if I were Martin Luther, I would hammer such a list, and this is just a rough draft, uh, uh, to the doors of the Federal Reserve, but I'd probably get arrested uh, the minute I took out my hammer. Um, never again should we pay attention uh, to uh, candidates who tell us we have to put uh, our agendas on hold uh, while uh, they bail out uh, the financial markets. Uh, if, this is, if this bailout is so important and so critical, then we have to pay for it.